Guys, welcome back to the Physique Factory podcast. And today we have a special guest, Simon Dutton, who's big on education, is a PT, online coach. So Simon, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I always hate these questions. I always have a completely different answer every time. It just feels weird to be in Riverside and not be doing my own show. Um, so yeah, so for people that don't know who I am, um, my name is Simon Dutton. I've been in the industry now close to 12 years. Um, working and running education for some of the, the biggest names in the fitness industry. Um, done a little bit of online coaching, but I, I think when I um, initially left my last company, my, my aim was to kind of, I went into online coaching, because that's what everyone does, right? And I work now for a gym called Hit PT here in Hong Kong for doing some one-to-one. And about a year after I'd done it, I realized like my my passion now has devol- you know, evolved into helping coaches. Um, I... I can I can definitely get Mary, mother of three, lawyer with three kids, you know, in, in shape. But I couldn't speak to her on Instagram. But I understand the problems of coaches. I've dealt with the problems of coaches. I've mentored people who have the problems that coaches do. Um, which led me to set up what is the 16-week coaching confidence course, which had its first live intake uh, January. It started in January, so we're midway through now. And that's the first time I've taken what I do with coaches and mentor them to get great results online. So I'm actually like helping you know, expanding sort of my reach because normally only people I mentor are people that are in front of me, either in Hong Kong or when I was in London. That's awesome. I mean, like with, with coaching coaches, you're going to get even more results because they've got a wider range of clients and it's just going to expand that way, isn't it? It's, it's one of those things, right? Like I, 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 I don't, I, I want to stay away from the cliche, like, you know, I'm just here to help as many people as possible. I want to help a million people <laughs> and change their lives. But it's true when you sort of like, what, what can I help as a one-to-one coach? Maybe 10 clients at a time. If I'm an online coach, I can probably help maybe 50 clients at a time if I want to give a good service. Now, if I help working on with 20, 30 coaches, two, three intakes a year, then the people I mentor face-to-face, then they've got their 10 clients, then they've got their online clients. Like The, the reach and the scope of that, it just, it just goes far more. And it's something I enjoy more. And I, I, I've known for a very young age, I was a very creative quite energetic and quite passionate person if I'm directed in the right way but maybe because I have ADHD if I'm directed in the wrong way I just can't apply myself and just feel a little bit shit sorry can I curse on this podcast you can beat me if not but um like curse all you want I was I was assuming with a Scotsman on the show that I'd be allowed to do it um (laughs) but like yeah so I I just realized that the I much more enjoy working with coaches now and I just know I can do a better job of it Sweet. So when did this like journey all start in the fitness industry? That's a good question. I mean, like I've always been involved in sport in some way. Like since I was about eight years old, I was playing rugby. Um, and I think it, but I could say, I could say that it's because I went into sport, but in reality, I was a kid that I was only child. I wouldn't say I was particularly lonely, mm-hmm. but I, I had, I had a track record of probably not necessarily always being the most popular kid at school feeling unheard, which led to a few confidence issues. And then I, in start of 2000, when I was about 10 years old, I uh, stay, I woke up in the middle of the night, turned on Channel 4, and the Royal Rumble was on, which is obviously this, also this Saturday, so that's quite exciting. Um, and I, I saw Triple H for the first time. And I don't know if it's necessarily just purely about the physique, but when I was a kid and I didn't have confidence, you see these, these wrestlers who literally captivate an audience like eyes are on them there's cheers there's everything and as a kid when i didn't really understand what wrestling was i just saw this physique and went that's how a man should look if i look like that people are going to take me more seriously and i don't think I, that didn't mean anything at the time at 10 years old but that sort of thought process lingered and then when i got into 17 18 i was like right i'm getting straight into the gym i want to look like triple h and i suppose i'm still trying to do that to this day <laughs> We're all chasing that Triple H physique. It's it's funny you mention that because I think like, you know, when I think back to like my past and my childhood and that, I think uh, that's somewhat what this is all stemmed from for me as well. I used to be big into WWE and things like that. And uh, yeah, I'd never really realized at the time, but you wonder if that's like, the first kind of like click for you the first thing that makes you kind of want to achieve that and um, sadly for me the thing that really did push me into the gym later on in life was and this is the most embarrassing thing ever was fucking Jordy Shore <laughs> <laughs> you never said that before <laughs> no I don't say it very often oh, brilliant. <laughs> but um 
I had a girlfriend at the time that liked watching it, and I ended up watching it on a weekly basis. And I was like, huh, okay. And then I split up with her, and I was like, well, these guys were going out pulling all these birds, so <laughs> I'll go to the gym. Yeah, it works for me. Um, fair to say it didn't work that well. <laughs> there's a trend in there's a trend in that though, right? Like, like I mentioned the fact that part of it was me feeling like an outsider and feeling like I'm not listened to and wanting to get sort of a bit more gravitas, I suppose. And you were saying it was like, okay, these guys are jolly sure pulling all the birds, like. It, it, I, and this is part of the reason why I, I think I'm, I'm so passionate about helping coaches because, like, they to the general population, coaches come across like the most confident people in the world. When in reality, I would argue there's ten percent of people that just like they're the, the jocks of the room. But like ninety percent of coaches are people that have got into the industry because of their own lack of confidence, their own insecurities. Why most people join the gym, they've probably got more body dysmorphia than all of their clients because as soon as they start working a gym, they're forever small. Like when I first started working at UP, I was working with Justin McGuire. And if you don't know who that guy is, he's, he was 120 kilos shredded. So wow. like I was never going to be a big guy. And I, 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 part of the reason why I call my, you know, my course, the coaching confidence course, it's like I'm working to take away imposter syndrome from coaches because we, everyone has it. Like, there's so many good coaches out there, and this is the only industry in the world where, well, maybe there is other ones, but the only one I can think of, where the best don't become the most financially rewarded. Yeah. And I don't help them with, I don't help them with mentoring. I don't, I don't put, like, O's on their bank balance. I help them get results. But a lot of the good coaches do not, not, do not push themselves or promote themselves anywhere near enough because they don't feel they're good enough. They compare themselves to... The, the guy on Geordie Shaw that's selling his herbal booty and making millions and conning even more people. I think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that's of why we're selling the not people. the best coaches out there who are really good at selling themselves and marketing, all that side of things. They're the ones who's doing really well. But when we've like done all these courses, like Integra, RTS, all that sort of stuff, it's so we're really good coaches, but it's just how to get it out there. Well, like if you and if, and if you look at that, right? Like for for example, if we use Integra as a prime example. Michael is one of the brightest names in the world. And I'm not just, I didn't say in the industry, I said in the world. If you put him in any other science realm, he would find his way to swim, right? The guy's unbelievable. And even he is an unknown asset. He's a, he's a, he has a cult following. You know, he, he, he is like a small, like indie movie that everybody loves rather than a mainstream blockbuster. And you look at all those people on the, that course, like, like all, I, the, all those people, I, none of them have a huge following, myself included. Paul Standall's probably the closest, and Paul Standall's quite open with the with his confidence issues and he struggles with OCD and things like this. And that isn't doesn't isn't that a sh telling of the industry? We've got a group of the best coaches in there, and they're not anywhere near the the top fifty personal trainers in terms of audience. Yeah, it is crazy when you think about it like that. There's more knowledge, but obviously less audience to get that to. Exactly. I think the thing as well, like um, I, I was saying to you, James, like when we went on Integra Labs to begin with, and I seen all the names that were in there, I was like, "Fuck me, we were like, we're bottom of the pile here. These guys all know their shit. They all know what they're talking about. Like, like almost like scared to talk sort of thing." And then you realise as we're going through some of the stuff that like everyone's kind of on the same boat, and like although these people may appear confident and appear to have knowledge, and don't get me wrong, they definitely do. As soon as they're asked a question by Michael, it's like, eh, 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 I can't remember. It's when you put um, on the spot, though. Just yeah, 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 definitely. I hate you forget, that. You forget, you, you forget your mother's name when you put on the spot by Michael. <laughs> like it's, but what's, but that, that's a really good point, though, right? Like it's the, one of the big things. When I looked at like how do I put across and how do I market the launch of, of this course, I was like, one of the key things that I feel have helped me I'm going to say manage imposter syndrome. I'm not going to say beat it because I deal with it all the time. And one of the reasons why for ages I was like, well, I've got eight years experience in mentoring trainers and I didn't start it when I you know, had the opportunity. Why? Because I was comparing myself to Luke Lehman, Jordan Shallow, you know, Michael. And I sat there for a while. I don't know what it was, but something in the summer made me go, hold on. These people aren't competition. They are allies. I have Jordan Shallow's phone number. I, I got on a call with Michael the week before I made that decision. And I'm like, what what a, what am I doing? Like it's it's that imposter syndrome. So I think it's 
there's an element of education that coaches need to have, right? The more, the more tools in your toolbox, the less you're going to get stumped. The most of the times I think I feel like a fraud is when a client comes in with a problem, I try something that normally works and it doesn't work, and now I feel like an idiot, right? So if you get knowledge, you know, you, you have practice, so you actually like get more experience practicing stuff on the on the gym floor, and then essentially you're looking at mainly a reframe. Like the more you can sort of reframe um, how somebody's feeling, and or just 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 enough to keep them moving. Like it's the um, rather than thinking that they they need to be as smart as a Jordan Shallow, they just need to be smarter than the client, and that could be enough to just to get them out there, get more practice, and in turn beat that imposter syndrome. The analogy I was used with. The power of a reframe is when I was, um, you know, kind of you relate to this. When I was 17, 18 years old, I was also shit at chatting at women. And um, <laughs> I'm still like, shit at it, to be fair. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm engaged because otherwise I'd never find love again. Um, <laughs> but I, I remember I was like, it was, I had a lot of reasons why I didn't have confidence with women, right? Like I'd gone through a couple of messy breakups. My, the first person I ever said that I fancied laughed in my face. So I was just, petrified of going and speaking to people. So I put these girls on a pedal, so I'm like, right, they're 10 out of 10, I can't go speak to them, they wouldn't want to speak to me. And every time I went out and didn't speak to someone, I went home alone, it just kept reinforcing this process I had in my head. No one finds me interesting, no one finds me attractive. All these friendship issues, again, reinforcing all these patterns. And then I, 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 um, I saw a YouTube video by a dating coach called Johnny Cassell, who I don't think does it anymore, which is such a shame, because I really want him on the podcast to, to ask this question and talk about this. But he said, a girl can only be five out of 10 on looks alone. She makes up the other five by if she's interesting, she's cool, what she does for a living, you know, all these great traits that make a human a human. And did that take away my fear immediately? No. But what it did is it just took the edge off it a little bit and reframed it. So then I would be like, more often than not go, I'm now excited to see if you make the other five. And I still got turned down every now and again. But the more I did it, the more positive reinforcement I got. And the, that, that, I, people don't find me interesting, things started to fade away a little bit. And I think if we take this into the realm of coaching, it's like, what are the things that coaches are, are unsure about doing? Whether that is getting out and doing their outreach because they don't feel anyone's going to do it. Whether that's putting stuff on social media because they don't think they're smart enough. Whether that is going on education because they don't want to be called out, not doing the homework on that sort of stuff, right? It's And that's why a lot of what I do in the in, you know when I start working with coaches, like, right, let's teach them how to learn. Because most people, when they study, it's just literally trying to memorize origins and insertions for an hour and a half. And that gets no one anywhere. But if you went, okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes of that. 10 minutes of going to watch someone I admire teach this. And then 10 minutes getting in the gym and using this, it's going to stick in more. And then if I then have to then get reinforcement and feedback from that, that's going to give me a reference. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, that's why the hamstring feels be curl feels better when I posterior tilt my pelvis. I understand the origin of assertion of the hamstring now, and and I think I think that can help a lot of coaches just having that sort of framework and a bit of a nudge, just to, to help. Them. Yeah, it's all about application. I mean, we can do all these courses, learn all the stuff, but if we're not going out there, you learning it, using it, and how to actually apply it to the right people, then that's the most like crucial part of it. How it just keeps in your head. Yeah, a hundred percent, and then. And also as well, like how many courses have you got on and just feel like you've, it's been great, but I have, I, I don't know how to apply any of it. Yeah. And the, like, that's why, what, what, what I think is, you know, my USP is that everyone gets one to one, some one to one mentoring in the program. They get a 60 minute course and they get four one to one session where we go through the clients and apply it with them. Because if you can't apply what you learn on a course, it's kind of pointless. And for years I did course after course after course after course. And because I had no structure and no system. Yeah in the way I was delivering my product, it was just sort of like information overwhelm. So I took a bit, but whereas now, because I have a client journey, because I know how I work, I can take a tool from here and apply it here. I know this tool is not good for me, but it's good, so I'll put it somewhere else. Or this tool is useless, and now I know why, because I can filter this information. Because for years, I, I was that guy learning all the courses and being, without sounding big-headed, smart and a lot of the trainers I was Collecting learning. qualifications. But there was and... Oh, yeah. yeah, but trainers were getting better results than me, and I was frustrated. And the difference was, I, had, I was as a, a trainer. I'm not going to name him because I'm basically going to call him an idiot. But you'll probably know who it is if he listens. <laughs> but he was a charismatic guy. He said quite openly that he wasn't the smartest trainer, but he had a very routine, 
this is what a guy gets, this is what a girl gets, and I got really good at that. Is he adaptable? No. Is it a long-term strategy? No. But I tell you what, he was so good at it that he got so many more results because he kept things simple and he got really good at one thing. You know, it's like get get in, get a mentor. If you're, if you're new to this, you know, and you're a PT listening to this, sign up to a mentor and get really good at that one mentor's system before you get shiny object syndrome and do something else. If you like Jordan Shallow, learn Prescript to become a fantastic Prescript coach and then broaden. If you like, you know, CASM and N1, do all the CASM courses before going and doing something like Integra or if you want to do Michael's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Because I didn't. My ADHD brain says I want to learn from everything. <laughs> I can and while relate that's a, to that. While that's a good thing, while that's a good thing, you want to learn from as many mentors as possible, just not all at once. It's a lot to take in a process. There's no way you could, like, keep all that information if you was to do that. I think... I think the big thing as well is like, um, you know, everyone's so quick to want to jump online nowadays as well. It's like actually getting in the gym and spending that time that's, with different that, people, like seeing different people. That's things. one thing I was going to say. So in my opinion, you need to have a couple of years in the gym actually doing one-to-one -one training people before you move online. But at the moment you see it social media, literally someone's just done a level three course or whatever, or they've not even done that. And they've just thought, right, I want to be an online coach. Or they've competed once. They thought, oh, no, it's good. I'll get shredded, compete once. And then it's like, I'm now taking on online clients. And it's like, oh, God, not again. They've got no idea how to train, coach, or anything like that. But I'm so glad you said that. And, and I, I, I also, like, look at, like, this laptop lifestyle stuff. And, like, don't be wrong. You know, I'm 32 now. I've been doing this for 12 years. I, I am, I am, you know, still do some one-to-one -one coaching. And I'm, I'm slowly moving away from it because you know now i'm 30 you know you know the, the typical thing right everyone's bodybuilding in their 20s and in 30s you all start doing brazilian jiu-jitsu right like <laughs> it's like jordan it. peters and <laughs> like everybody right and i was like i'm gonna fight it i'm not gonna do it i'm not i'm gonna be a bodybuilder forever i'm 32 and i'm sitting there going maybe i'll book a brazilian jiu-jitsu <laughs> class i think it's coming for me <laughs> like other priorities in life are starting to take over so i was like you know i i, I think you see these laptop lifestyle stuff, though, and people are like, oh, you can work from the beach. First off, what beach has a good enough <laughs> Wi-Fi signal to do check-ins? Never, I've never seen one. I've never thought of that. Right? Got loads of Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> to to totally impractical. And and but I, I just I you, you can tell you can tell from a mile away the coaches that have never been on the gym floor. I, I have this real pet hate at the moment on Instagram. I see it so much where people bang down. Calorie deficit and progressive overload. You just need a calorie deficit. You just need a progressive overload. I'm like, no shit, Sherlock. How are you getting that progressive overload? If someone is throwing weight all over the place and can't control it, that is a useless piece of information. If they want a calorie deficit, okay, cool. But they're emotionally eating five, six days a week. Just telling them, well, you just got to be in the deficit. It's bollocks. And if you've never worked with people or even ne never even done it yourself, because I see a lot of bodybuilding coaches now and I, I i understand i'm not the biggest guy in the room either but i see a lot of bodybuilding coaches talk about like reverse, reverse banding and strength profiles and like i'm like have you done a single lateral raise in your life just one just try one and i'm just like you know i don't understand how where like there's no results they don't have any depth or nuance to their words and they're they 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 just need a bit of time under the bar just just a bit working that's with people. it uh, so i'm so glad but, um, in terms of when you see people batting words that like strength profiles and they just don't understand it on social media and it's like bodybuilding old school bodybuilding coaches like that or oh you shouldn't even be bothered thinking about anything like that it's all like the old school lot and um yeah there's a, there's a lot of that isn't there there's, there's, a, there's a lot of that and there's also people that don't understand it in very different ways right so you've got the people that like that they want, they want to sound like they're taking on clients that um, Jordan Peters is taking on, but they're taking on Mary from Slough. And they're like talking about sort of like, oh, well, you've got a match resistance profiles and strength profiles. I'm like, what are you talking about? How do I get toned? You know, like, like the people aren't talking to their client. They're talking to their bodybuilder and friend in the gym. Um, and then you get the other people that you, you who have gone the other way down the spectrum that talk about sort of like, Oh, yeah, reverse banning's just making it easier. No, 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 no. Reverse banning's making it brutally hard and every second of the rep, it makes it harder. So you get you get all this sort of stuff. But I think it now, like, the mechanics world now, I think, is falling into two camps. 
we have the the sort of like the the muscle mechanics crowd, which is what I would say is the strength profiles, resistance profiles, the bodybuilding mechanics crowd, and they're in one camp. And then you've got the movement mechanics crowd, where everyone's talking about ribcage flare, anterior pelvic tilt, and breathing mechanics, right? But no, very few people bridge the gap between the two. <laughs> like I, I, and I, and I've, I, I, I have been a victim of this because I, because I've got long femurs. And I first delved into this wor wormhole. I was, people were like, don't squat, Simon. That's a terrible exercise for you. And if I, my goal was, if my only goal in life, like, do I want kids? No. Do I want a career? No. I just want big quads. Then congratulations, Simon. That is, the, that is, that is a good piece of advice. But at some point, if you never go into any form of squatting, training could get pretty boring. You know, there was no process of how to get there. So in turn, my movement got considerably worse. So that there's there's no there's no nuance there's no thought process behind it it's just sound bites now and I sound like a grumpy old man so I'll, I'll stop and let you ask another question <laughs> <laughs> again social media sound bites yeah, right, everywhere right. it's all absolutes and sound bites isn't it it was like you have to do this to get these results and then it, there's like camps everywhere like a certain bodybuilder says this and another person says that mm. and that's all it is tends to go on social media but that's what you've got to be like that on social media you need to say something quick to get people's attention and then once you've got it then you need to give it a bit more context but the amount of times that people don't do it i think ben Yanis, we had him on the podcast he does that really well he says something like a, a really like mm. absolute statement but then he backs it up with more stuff he's on my he's on my um message list to uh, to come on my show so um if you're listening ben you're gonna get a message <laughs> from me very very soon um, but I quite <laughs> like I quite like some of his stuff, right? Because it's like I don't I don't mind being a bit controversial. That's that that. But as long as it's not controversial, just for the sake of being yeah. controversial, like if you're something to call out, call it out. Like I'm, 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 I I quite I quite like a lot of his stuff. That's cool. I like the way he delivers it as well with the with the kind of memes and things like that. You know, it's just it's if if you're just a normal person looking at them. They're so much easier to take in than sometimes like you see, um, for example, like some N1 post where it's just like a shit ton of writing and I don't even read it. And I'm like, I'm into this stuff. And if I'm not reading it, then who else is going to read it? Have you ever, have you ever, I'm not, I'm not calling it out because Cass has been very, very good to me over my career. And I think he's, he's one of the smartest minds in the industry. But have you ever done no, a N1 Is it definitely worth doing? No. So they're, they're, it's I've already asked this as well. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, right? <laughs> of course, it's a hundred percent worth doing. It, uh, but I, I, I've, I've very rarely do have a course that gives so much value. But it's so much, like, and it's so specific. Like, like if 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 you go from four reps to five reps, it's an entirely different stimulus. You know, like, and fatigue doesn't play into this, right? Like, you you're doing mechanic construction or you're doing, you know, you know, metabolic stress, but. Um, the the guy is the guy is incredible, and the guy the, he will ruffle some fellas as well, and sometimes he gets a bit. Uh, I think sometimes he gets a bit possessive over things he teaches in these camps. I've seen him tell people off because he because they use the deficit split squat, which he didn't invent the split squat. Sorry, Cass, but <laughs> he, but but also but I also think he's doing it because he want, I do generally think Cass wants to better the industry, and I do think he's very proud, and um I and then like when you. If you, when you chat to the guy, like he, he's the person that if I put a clip up from the podcast, he will always put it, he always accepts a collaboration oh, post. He doesn't need to do it, right? He always reposts it, right? And like, like those, I, I think I was having a conversation with on a podcast recently when I was last time I was a guest on the show about you learn a lot about people when you're when a podcast, right? And like, I, I've like the people that like they don't need to help me out. Like they, they're huge names, they're much more big, you know, much bigger name than I am. But they, they will, they will treat me in the same way they'll treat if they went on Modern Wisdom, right? Like maybe they went on Chris Williams' show or something like that. And, and I think that says a lot about people. I've had people I've never met before that are huge names, like Chris Van Vliet, who um, interviews um, some of the best wrestlers in the world and film stars, came on the show, never met before, just sent me an Instagram message, like, yeah, no, why not? Always willing to help out. And yet, I've, I've had somebody once this comes on the show that says, cancelled like an hour before the show saying his kid was sick. And then at the time we were supposed to record, he went on Instagram live yeah. with somebody else. So, like, it, it, you learn a lot about people. Like, you learn, like, you realise how much of the industry is smoke and mirrors. 
because you might not hire everyone to realize how much people are smoking mirrors, but you see it. Like, I don't mind if I send a message to someone and they don't, it doesn't get read. People are busy, right? Like, you don't need to respond to little old me. Like, I'm not that proud. But, you know, like, sometimes you get a message from someone that goes, I bet you've had it. Yeah, I'll come on your show. And then you feel like you're nagging them for months on end when they don't yeah. get onto the show. I'm like, just say no or don't reply. <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I just, I don't know where, I've read completely off track of things there, but I just think it's, oh yeah, with, with Cass, I think, I, I do I do think he actually wants to bring the standard up. And I think if he, if he sees that in you, he'll do what he can to support you. No, oh, sweet. So it's definitely worth looking at. I'll, uh, I'll look into it. And I t- and I tell you that off air as well. Just in case. <laughs> I mean, I've just done um, so obviously we're doing like the Integra stuff weekly, aren't we? And then I've just uh, I'm pretty much doing prescripts as well. Was that I'm halfway through that, which is all right. It's a, mm. sort of a different approach to things, a different way of looking at things, but it is interesting. I, another person I have a lot of time for is Jordan. Um, he he's another person, and I. I, I I say this to my podcast co-host all the time that we 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 almost advertise other people more than we do ourselves on the show. Um, but like Jordan's another one, right? The amount of times I've messaged Jordan and just gone, "Hey man, I need some advice on this. Can I book a console?" And he goes, "Yeah, booking a call. Never ask for payment oh, or anything." Like he's there to now. People listen to this, coaches. Don't <laughs> assume that all of you can message Jordan Shallow and get a free call. I didn't expect to either. Right, but you know, but I just, I just, it just, I think it says a lot to the characters of the people that they, 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 they obviously are business savvy enough to make money as they should because they deserve it, but they are generally, um, generally just good people, and that, and that's, I think, touch wood, fingers crossed. You know, I, 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 I do all right in this mentorship game, and I end up with the following the similar lengths. If I do, I want to kind of keep that ethos where, if the podcast grows, which is my biggest passion project and my biggest pride and joy. I want to be able to always be a show that if I can get great names and I've been lucky to have some incredible people come on the show, great. But some of the best episodes I've done are people that are, I want to say newer to the industry, but people that are less known than even me. And if I can help them, that's that's what, that's what the most interesting. That's sometimes the most interesting conversations, I think. Yeah, that's cool. It's interesting what you say, obviously, about like these guys want to help the industry. And we were talking earlier about people using terms and throwing things about that maybe they don't fully understand, you know, things like strength profiles, resistance profiles, this and that. But I think in a sense, like thanks to these guys, it is kind of filtering down. And although maybe people are using it and not understanding it, it's it's getting somewhere. You know, people are starting to open their eyes to it a little bit. And over time, you know, it will it will drip down even further. And, you know, eventually it hopefully will be common knowledge amongst trainers. The quality, the quality of the fitness industry, and particularly in the West, is is going, is getting so much better at a very, very fast rate. Um, I think, I think Asia are a little bit behind, but I think that's slowly improving as well with more gyms coming from, not a lot of expats coming over to these places and starting gyms, and I think that's filtering down. So I, I do think, you know, we forget sometimes in our, um, you know, in our little bubble that we're in in the fitness industry that we're still a very young industry, and I, I think, you know considering how young it is and how much it's in infancy, I think we do a lot of things very well. That's cool. Who, uh, who teaches RTS yeah, over in like Asia? Uh, in Hong Kong. Oh, really? No. Right. So there's, there's, a mar- there's, a mar- there's a market for it, if any of you boys want to move over here. Um, I'm moving back to the UK in tune. Um, and I've also only done the Integra courses. I've actually not done RTS uh, level one, level two. So I couldn't Sweet. do it. But um, Benny runs it in what? He's in Malaysia, isn't he? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. What, Maybe. What's his name again? Um, ben, Benny... Yeah, Benny Price. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he runs it in um, Malaysia, as far as I know. Um, another one we're hoping to get in the podcast, but um, still waiting to hear back. He's one we're <laughs> nagging. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was um, uh, the, the Jay Hawley, who runs the education for ATP, another gym here in Hong Kong. Uh, he's now moved to Singapore, but he was looking to do it. So I don't know. I think there's a couple of people as an RTS within that gym, but I don't. I don't know if they're they're, they're in, in talks to do it. It'd be good. I'd love. I'd love for one to, to open up here. I think. I think it's necessary. Um, you know, we're we're looking at doing some educational courses with the gym I work at now because there's just there's very little of it, which either means there is no market for it, and everyone just wants to put posts with their booty bounds on Instagram, and I'm an idiot for thinking they want education, 
or it means there is a gap in this market. And, and clean health are coming in a month or so. So there is obviously enough people to fill out a clean health seminar and warrant getting them over from Australia. So we'll see. Cool. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about uh, your programming, Simon. Um, I heard from a uh, um, solid source that you're very particular with your programming, um, and it's a real strong <laughs> point of yours. Um, you can probably guess what that source is, um, or who that source is, should I say. But Would that um, be Jack? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. had nothing but positive <laughs> things to say. Um, I'll say, again, I'll say that on here. I'll tell you the truth off here. <laughs> um, but, um, going into the programming, like, where would you start with a client? What's the first thing, like, break it down for us. What's the first thing you would look at when you've got a new client, um, particularly online as well, because obviously it's easier when you're in person, in a sense, but what would be the first thing you'd look at? I think going into the online stuff, I'll go directly into your question about programming as a whole in a second, but I do think on the online stuff, I do think templates get a really bad rap. I think the least personal thing you can do for a client is to start a program with a blank piece of paper. And I think that's the reason why a lot of coaches get really overwhelmed with program design because they have nowhere to start. Like it's just, a, and they just start with, and they always start writing exercises, right? Always. So you have this, how many exercises are there in the world? Millions. You could probably make one tomorrow if you wanted to. Like, like that's so much overwhelm to do. So I think with online, I did trial for a while, trying to get assessment videos and like work around that. And you realize that I like people will send you progress pictures in their underwear quite happily, but to send you a video of them doing a split squat <laughs> is a challenge. So like it's, it is more about getting a baseline. Um, so I think it's essentially when I, when I work with people online, depending on where, where they're at and how much experience they are, I will look at how experienced they are, uh, how many years are in the gym? Assume they're more beginner than they say they are. And I'd probably start most people either on a, if they're a completely beginner, like a full body GBC style program. Everyone does it. And, you know, some people like to give it a bad rap. But the reason why some of the most successful personal training companies in the world use GBC and in turn, everyone else started using GBC on the, as a byproduct is because it works for people who aren't going to the gym as often, are brand new, need some frequency, need some like repetition in some main lifts, right? Yeah, well, FLF really used it a lot and took it from those. And it's just if someone's only going to the gym like two, three times a week, you want to cram as much like volume frequency into that as possible, don't you? Ex exactly. Uh, or if they're a little bit more advanced, I might do um, something that I learned from Luke Lehman called a backloaded structural balance program. So we maybe work on some of the length tension discrepancies in the earlier parts of the workout and then have your big compound lifts a little bit lighter at the end so you can then just focus on almost use them as almost a skill based lift so you can spend a bit of time in the bottom ranges and then over time you start to bring those uh, main lifts towards the start of the workout and then that becomes now your traditional sort of hypertrophy strength training workout but when it comes to program design like when it comes to how I, how I build them I have I have something I teach called my program design pillars and I, the reason why I like this is because I think people don't know where to start with program design. They're starting, okay, which handle should I use on that pull down? Right, that's so far down the list of priorities when you're making a program, it's insane. So I like, what is the, what is the decision I can make right now that will make every other decision easier? So the first thing I will look at is periodization. A lot of trainers say, is it, do you need to periodize for gen popula general population? Because they will have random holidays. Their goals will change. They'll cancel sessions. And I think absolutely, yes, you do. I think your periodization model is not perfect with a gem pop and it's going to be a bit flawed and you're going to alter it along the way. But periodization does a couple of things. It lets the client in on where this is going long term, which gives them more confidence in you. Right. It gets more buy-in from the client. They know where you're going to be in 12 weeks, where you're going to be in six months. What happens when the diet's over? But it also means you have a starting point for reps. So if I say I'm going to choose a linear periodization model because I work with beginners and that tends to work quite well because higher repetition when they don't know how to generate some intensity. And as they start to learn how to train, you increase the intensity, lower the overall volume, right? That works well for beginners. Undulating models tend to work well for intermediates. Um, and then I've got something called step loading, but not the traditional step loading in reps um, that I use for hypertrophy. So... I choose that periodization model. Let's say it's linear. Now, because of that, I know my reps are going to start around probably somewhere between 10 to 15, right? Girls on the higher end, guys on the slightly lower end, right? 
Now, because of that, now I've chosen those repetitions. My sets, my reps, so my sets, my tempo, my rest is easy. I'm not going to do three minute rests with a set of 12. I'm not going to do a four, two, one, zero tempo with a set of 12, unless my client says they want to be in the gym three hours a day. So I'm not going to do six sets of 15. So all those decisions are now easier. So now I've got, I've got, I've got those things in place. Then I will look at my main movement categories. And they were made, like, generally, this is, this is how I think about program design um, with beginners. I have eight main movement categories, which if you're doing a full body GBC, is your A's and your B series in your first two workouts. So there'll be a vertical push and pull. There'll be a horizontal push and pull. There'll be a um, bilateral squat pattern, which could be a leg extension if someone's unstable and doesn't, can't move well. Uh, there'll be a unilateral squat pattern. Right, so we can open up things like the rec fam and just work how they would work through gait. There'll be a hip extension exercise and there'll be a knee flexion exercise because I think knee flexion is one of the most notoriously undervalued uh, movement patterns in the world because the, the hamstrings have a great ability to stabilise both the hip and the knee, something that a lot of people struggle with. So there'll be my eight patterns. So let's say, let's say I did uh, a vertical pull in A1, then I'm probably going to do a, you know, a, a, a squat pattern in A2. Right, and then whatever I don't do will be the other two in the, the the second workout, and I just have it like that. That becomes super easy. I have a couple of optional ones. I if I, if I they don't have target areas, which would be like an anti rotation, anti extension exercise, just so I can work on little the little things I know that are going to become problems when it gets heavy. If I can sort those issues out now, it becomes easier for me later down the line. But so once I've got those eight movement patterns in, I look at target areas and remedial work. So either remedial work is the stuff that's going to be the little weak links in the chain that I can help, you know, that helps me in phase two and phase three. Or it's the areas that the client says, I want the biggest arms in the world. I don't care about balance. I want insanely big arms. Cool. We're going to do that. Or um, I'll, I'll look at what is their weakest link in terms of their overall balance of their physique. So if any of you have seen a picture of my back, right, my back is quite overdeveloped. My triceps are quite crap. So my... My, my um, triceps make my back look smaller. My back does not make my triceps look bigger. So if I put the most muscle on my, more muscle on my triceps than anywhere else, that would make me look like I've gained way more muscle than I actually have because it would bring the overall balance up. So I will look at those muscle groups. And that's where I sort of work in my sort of C series and D series. And then where possible, I will try and hide, re like, like combine the two by hiding remedial work within their target areas. So if I've got a client who is, Got really, te I, I, we can get into the topic of improving posture and what I think about that in a second. But like, let's say we've got somebody we want to improve their ability to have shoulder extension. We want to try and open up the chest. We want to get them to length and range of the bicep. People often get a bit, you know, niggly. So if I want to sort that and they also want big arms, I can do an inclined bicep curl. If I want to get into lower traps, but they have no overhead range, I could go a prone Y raise. So that still works to delts. They're still getting shoulders and arms but they're also getting shoulders and arms, which contributes to the little small stuff that I want to work at the same time. Um, and then once I've, once I've got that, that's pretty much the program. And then my last two pillars are going to be uh, exercise progression, which is a really complex topic and not as easy as people first think when they get into the industry, that this is a progression. That's one thing progression. I'm really looking so, into myself at the different. moment. You can look at pretty much every variable in the gym and then try and progress it. Like Things like even joint forces, like there's, there's so many things you can look at to progress and I've never even really looked at it that way before. You know, you know when you like you learn something and then you learn you, this as a topic that all of a sudden makes you realise everything you've learned <laughs> is a sack of shit? Progressions and regressions are that topic for me. So like when you start off, you get this is your progression. Okay, cool. So then you can open up the wormhole in your direction and go, there's joint forces, there's internal moments arms, external force, external stability, internal stability. You can go all down these nitty gritty things of things you could progress, lever lengths, etc. Et but then you can go down another wormhole. What's a progression and which is a regression? A barbell hip thrust or an incline hyper? It depends. <laughs> there we go. They're different. They're different, right? So... And, and like I put a post about this yesterday, right? Is and people would assume I, you know, I had one of my coach of confidence guys do a case study. He went, I went to a stat from a seated dumbbell press to a standing overhead military press, right? Because that'll be a progression. Okay, 
if your goal is stability and controlling rib cage and pelvis, you could argue, you could make a great case for that being a progression. But if your goal is hypertrophy, that's a shit <laughs> that's progression. That's it. That's it. It's just a goal, isn't it? Because you've taken st you've taken stability away. You, can't you better watch what you're saying here. James got a lot. Oh of yeah, so I put this. on was like I, I just so I had to oh, sort of make me. it wasn't an absolute <laughs> statement. It was so see people doing this like <laughs> kneeling pull down thing, and I was like, there's a lot better things to do for that because you're losing a lot of stability. You can't lift as much load than what you would be if you braced into a pad or even like braced into a bent. Yeah, yeah that's powerful. it. And then same yeah. with like a uh, barbell overhead press. So I said, just do it seated, and you'll be able to lift more increased force production so on and then loads of people didn't like it. it was like what do you mean you can't load an overhead press and i was like you can to a certain extent but not as much as you can do some doing something seated which is more stable and they just didn't understand the the concept of it well you, the, you know, another thing you also got to think of right we've all heard the thing at the moment like the the latest sound bites in the hypertrophy research if you go within five reps of failure that's the that's the most important thing you can do it with six reps or you can do it with 50 reps as long as you're within five reps of failure. Okay. I, I don't argue with this. First thing, how many people know what five rep, one to five reps? That's a big number, that, isn't it? People are that rubbish. That is a big number away from it. Yeah. Well, how many people go, oh, yeah, I've got one left in the tank and the rep hasn't mm. started to slow down? Right. Cool. You're nowhere near. But also, I would argue the goal is hypertrophy. We are talking five reps away from muscular failure. Not technical failure. Muscular failure. So, in that example, let's use a squat. Let's use a squat as an example. You could load a squat maybe more than a hat squat. But if you can't take it to that threshold safely, is it a better exercise for that goal? And, the, and this is the thing, because when I first was taught the exercise mechanics RTS sort of stuff by people obviously with second and third hand, I'm not teaching this. When I learned this originally, it wasn't from Michael, right? Like, I'm not, you know, tarnishing his knowledge because it's second to none but like i was told not to squat but like depends on the goal so what happens when my goal changed now me getting into a deep squat there's other muscles there that help me be more stable get out of pain eliminate back pain teach me to brace now you can you can obviously regress that term again exercises to more stable ways of learning how to brace but you want to integrate that eventually so like Regressions of regression are such a complicated topic because it's so goal dependent, it's so individual dependent. Um, there's so many things that come into play here that I think it's I, I think it's a fun topic. But most people they talk about progression and regressions, and they are taking people on to build muscle, and they don't know. So many coaches don't know the three drivers of hypertrophy. So many coaches don't know how fast is lost in a cellular level. Now, do you need to know how fast is lost at a cellular level? No. You can put someone on a calorie deficit and you can be really good at talking to them and that's, you'd be a great coach. But don't you think you should? It's like my, I could give my surgeon an instruction manual to take out one of my kidneys, right? He probably doesn't need to know what the rest of the body does, right, to do a, to do a right job. But I'd really like it if he did. And this is the thing we've got for now. I think it's good as well when a client asks you a question and you don't just have, you know, an, a yes or no answer. You've got depth to the knowledge within that um, rather rather than just this kind of like answer you'd give to everyone. Um, so I think, it, as you say, it gives confidence. It's like your surgeon knowing about the rest of the body. It's like it just gives them confidence in you as a coach. Um, well, there's a drawback to that, though, right? Before, sorry to cut you off, but like is, is the fact that I can over describe things because I want people to know. I want to help them. And I then it comes back to that thing, um, think science, speak client. Yes, Definitely. yeah, 100%. See, we're saying, like, squeeze your terrors major on the gym floor. <laughs> like, what, is, what are you talking about? Like, and people, people do it in the food as well. Can he take 30 grams of carbs? Right? I've had a client once, right, that sent me a picture. It was like 800 grams of protein, one meal, boom. I replied first, one. I've never said have 800 grams of protein in a day, let alone a meal. Two, it's the amount of protein within the meat, not the weight of the meat. And three, you've weighed the plate. So, like, if I, if I, if I just said to him, take 30 grams of carbs, is he going to know what to do? Not a chance. Speaking food. 
yeah. And go, going back to just like the progression to regressions thing as well, um, you know, I think RTS do this really, really well with the exercise continuum. That's like mm. awesome. Like I, I've, I refer back to that quite often actually. And that's a good way of like so. really looking at that and breaking it down because it is such a complex subject and it gives you that framework. Like you said, like you've got your kind of pillars that you work around. Having some sort of framework to go by has just got to be, um, yeah, it's paramount to success in, in programming, I would say. I still use a, like like a, a general progression thing where I start people, but it's progressions based off stability. And I know then if I wanted to change the parameters, like progressions based off hypertrophy, that could all be jumbled up. But I use a stability based progression system to sort of kind of go, right, where are you probably going to sit on this? And then I can tailor that to the goal. But it gives me a starting point. But no more than that. It's not by what I go phase to phase. Yeah. Where um, where would you say is the best place to go learn more about programming? I, I can tell, obviously, from what you said, you've obviously, you know, you, you've learned a lot about programming. Where would you um, where would you say the best place for someone who's new to this to kind of approach it? <laughs> Me? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> There's always um, got to be a plug. I'm, I'm, well, exactly. I'm always biased, right? Because I teach people programming. Um, no. Um, oh, this... It's, there's so many ways to program, right? It depends It depends who you resonate with. That, like, and that's the big thing, right? I made the joke about me. But if you come on this podcast and go, oh, I quite like that, Simon. I, I, a lot of his stuff made sense. Then maybe it is me. But if you might you might go onto the show and go, God, that Simon's a loudmouth prick. Then I am not the person for you. Um, people I've learned from a lot. Um, Luke Lehman. Um, generally one of the smartest people in the world. Um, and also, while he can sometimes go super deep on stuff and maybe a little bit too far, he also is very good with analogies and just being able to. Um, to he's just he's just a fun dude. He's not like nerdy bodybuilder one hundred and one where you can't have a laugh with him. Like I I, I actually want to learn from him. Um, he's taught me a lot. Casim's taught me a lot. Uh, Stefan Kazoltz from Kilo Strength has taught me loads. That's very polyquin. It's very strength stuff. But I tell you what. If you want a starting course to give you sort of like a few sort of like guidelines, like I am a very big fan when you're learning something, learn the rules and then learn how to break those rules. Stefan Casalt teaches you the rules, like things like the 90 degree principle. No, 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 no. So, so are you, are you familiar I think with I've heard of it, yeah. Steph? Yeah, so Steph used to be, um, run the Polycon group when Polycon was out of it for a while alongside Luke and he um he has now got he is one of the best periodization minds on the planet. He hasn't periodized month to month, year to year. He's got decade upon decade progressions now. That's how in depth this guy goes. But he'll talk about things like, okay, if I'm doing a pressing variation, like an overhead press that moves the scapula, I may go neutral grip in pull downs and row variations where there's not so much movement in the scapula. So you you balance the two. Um, he also talks about the 90 degree principle. So what he's found by working with tons of athletes, that if, if, if you're doing pressing, if you've got in one phase an overhead press, the accessory work would be the flat press. Because if you're more than 90 degrees, let's say you get overhead and decline, it's too far apart an angle to really have a decent carryover between the two. But if you did overhead press and incline press, they're so close that the level of fatigue would limit yeah. the training volume. So, like, when you do a phase, if the focus is overhead press, you know the accessory press is going to be flat. If your uh, main lift is an incline press, you know the accessory press is going to be a decline because they're 90 degrees apart. Now, is that a hard and fast rule that you've got to, you've got to use? Of course it isn't. Programming's creative. But it, it, it gives you a starting point where you go, well, what, what do I put as an accessory? Like, so many like, people are confused by that, and they're looking at, like, what part of the, like, where's the breakdown in the squat, which is always going to be at the bottom, right? Like, who fails at the top of a squat? But, like, understanding that stuff, it's like, you're overcomplicating it. Like, I just want to be able to help you get something down on paper. Do it, and then you can learn what's good, what's bad, how you want to learn from that. So he's really good with that. Um, and I think that's a really good place for a lot of people to start. Uh, and if you, if you are a bit more a sucker for punishment, in terms of, Wanting to like go into the nerd stuff and prepare to have your head blown off, but it's really good. Then you're going to start looking at, in this order, you're looking at uh, Pat Davidson, who's also just a really good dude, by the way. Recommend having him on the podcast if you haven't already. Um, Michael Golden, right, obviously, but he's really good at like tailing it back. And then if you if you really, really, really want your head blown off, go and study Bill oh, Hartman. Cool. 
I'm just glad when you came up with that 90 degree stuff, you weren't on about like that. You know that doctor? Oh, Ray I know. When, yeah, that, as soon like, as you said it, I shit. thought it was something like that. I it wasn't that. <laughs> no, what don't get him on the podcast. I if don't you, know this. It's a, yeah. Um, if, go and search him. It's, um, <laughs> well, well, just... well t- tell, me why, tell me why I should be warned. What's his 90 degree go thing on. so I know? So he, he doesn't go beyond 90 degree with any sort of pressing or squats or anything. I don't think he goes beyond 90 degree with anything. If if I might be butchering that to be fair, but like when you when you look at his page, yeah, he only goes like, to 90 degree. But fuck? And Joe, uh, Joe Adam Meekins, the physio guy, who smashing it on social media at the moment. The um, so he always did, does. Is he the guy who did the bullshit? The bullshit. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. So yeah. he's done like videos of his page and just. You know, reacted to him because it's so ridiculous that he does. But have a look. At, what's he called again? The guy, Joel Seedman, Doctor Joel Seedman. But he, he does train like uh, NFL athletes. And to be fair, I mean, if it improves their performance, <laughs> it works. But yeah. so yeah. there's yeah. that like, thing between being yeah. efficient and effective, though, isn't there? So there's effective. It's going to like improve something, but being efficient, it's going to be, do a better job. I talked to yeah. someone about this before, and what they're taking it was because the stuff they're doing is so ineffective with Joel Seedman that they're actually getting a lot of rest and recovery, so therefore they're getting better performance. <laughs> <laughs> there could be I something mean, in it. <laughs> may- maybe, maybe. Like, oh my god, that, that's yeah. I know that that's not what I was talking about at all. Um, but <laughs> the, I, the I, stuff I do, you're I on about made more sense. Of- Good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad it came across that way. Because um, I, 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 every day, you like Jack saying I'm so precise with my program design. I still think I'm winging it and making up as we go along. But there was a great phrase that uh, Chris Williamson said um, in a recent episode of the Modern Wisdom podcast, which I love. Um, he said he, someone told him it's idiots all the way up, and I think that's a wonderful reframe when people are starting to get into imposter syndrome, like because all the people that I looked up to when I worked at Virgin Active 12 years ago, I I have far surpassed. But I, I, I still, the ceiling now of the people I look up to is bigger than ever. Because now I'm looking to those people like, like if I'm going to sit there and judge my ability of understanding anatomy by comparing myself to Bill Hartman, I might as well give up now. So like, so, But it's always going to be that person. And you also don't know the the full story behind those people right yeah it's just a, a lot a lot of this is just practice and really in it and using it and you know the more you do it the more it's going to get stuck in your head like you know again it's like i've, I've only been in industry like working in the industry for the last couple of years really and it's like me comparing to you and all these courses you've done and all the programming that you know all the stuff you're talking about there like and you know you've you've just kind of got to be you've got to accept where you're at and just be in that never-ending pursuit of being better and remember that like, you're way ahead of me when I was two years into this game. Like, let me let me make you feel better by telling you a worker that I probably would have done at some point when I was at Virgin Active about two years into the industry. So there would have been we had a we had the people on the treadmill and we had this bit a little bit of a, it wasn't really a trap but it was like this padded area people did stretching and I had these two box jump platforms and they were staggered so there was like box jump level one. Box jump level two, box jump level three, and they'd sprint and they'd do ten box jumps on one, and then they'd have some exos on top. They say there's a kettlebell on top of the box jump, and they'd do the kettlebell swings, and they'd come down, sprint to the other side, go to the second box jump, and then maybe a viper on top of that one. And it was more about impressing the people on the treadmill and giving somebody a sensation of a workout than it actually was about getting them the result, right? And I couldn't work out, like I did all right in sessions wise, and a lot of people did come because they saw the workout that looked fun. But I couldn't work out why my colleague Ryan was consistently the highest performing trainer in the gym. Why? Because he was actually recalling people's loads and getting them in better shape. And it was only when I moved and actually got mentoring for the first time when I wasn't sort of winging it um, that I learned that. Because how many personal trainers have ever had a personal trainer? Ever. They train themselves and they train clients. So they can, they, yes, they can learn from trainers around them but it's a totally different ball game to when you actually get personal training yourself i've had coaches both online i've had coaches in person i've been trained by many 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 personal trainers i've paid for consults where i've gone and done an arm workout that made me want to be sick i tell you what you learn a lot from that stuff right like i i i did this i was saying this the other day i had a episode of my show where i talked about the most brutal workouts that we'd ever did and 
Two of them were arm workouts. One was done by a guy called Anthony Jones at Shapeshifter. Shout out to Ant. And it was just brutal. And the other one was Tom Curdington in Bath in Body Development. Um, he's like, you would never look at Tom and go, that's a great body composition coach. He's a small, round fella. But he's a boxing coach, essentially. But he's so good. And it was just unreal, this arm work. And you just realise how much you can get from very little. You know, and like, that, that's one of the great things about UP, especially in the early days when I first started. Like, some of the people there were just amazing. I remember when one guy came in and said he could deadlift 300 kilos to a guy called Eddie Baruta. And Eddie Baruta is a very stern Bulgarian trainer. And he made him cry with wow. one plate on a leg extension. <laughs> right? Like, 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 you learn very quickly what good personal training is. So you were way ahead of me when I was two years in the industry by a country mile, right? That's it. Um, so we've taken up enough of your time and I know it's getting close to 10 o'clock there and I know for me that is getting close to bedtime. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll cut it short at that. But um, do you just want to say a little bit about like this mentoring program you're running? Give yourself a wee plug. We'll, we'll, we'll let you promote yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I'm going to plug something else first because this is the thing I actually want to grow. I'm going to plug my podcast because I will definitely plug yeah. yours in return. Um, the Self Made Podcast is where, if you want to hear my unfiltered views on everything, mainly fitness, but about once every other month, I probably do something off topic from aliens to UFOs to feminism and the works. Um, but that is my pride and joy. So you can find it at the Self Made Podcast. You can find it on Instagram. You can find it on YouTube under me, Simon Kingsley Dutton. And then the course, uh, there's two ways if you want to uh, look at education uh, from me. I run uh, something called the 16 Week Coaching Competence Course. Uh, which is 60 weeks of uh, twice a week live lectures going over everything from training, nutrition, the gut, hormones, psychology, adherence, everything. And unlike a lot of courses, we have four one-to-one -one calls with me. So we'll literally go through every single one of your clients. If you're there struggling, we'll work together to get those results with you. So it's not just you'll learn information, know where to apply it. I will help you get better results. And that's the aim of this course. Um, and I run two, maybe three intakes of this a year. And then if you guys want a more of a lower ticket, like a teaser to what we do, I am currently building some um, self-paced courses with HIIT personal training, which aren't available yet, but will be within the next month. So follow me on at Kingsley Dutton on Instagram. You will know when those go up and they'll be the stuff you can do before the next uh, confidence intake. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Simon. It's been a pleasure having you. Um, and thank you for listening. Appreciate it. We'll have to say. We'll have to. We'll have to do a. We'll have to do an away leg.